Hello and welcome to today's issue of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franz. I'd like to thank my guest host, Asia Celestino, for holding down the studio last week while I was unable to be here. I was away at an ESOP training course, as a matter of fact, and that's because uh, I'm very fascinated with this business model, and we're going to be talking about that with two experts in the field, Hillary Schneider, who is CEO of ESOP Corporate Resources, and Mark Nelson, who is president of ESOP Corporate Resources. For you loyal listeners, you probably remember how fortunate we were to have Martin Stabas of the Beister Institute and Keith Mulchin of Community Bank on a previous show where we discussed ESOPs, and we talked generally about how ESOPs work, the basic design aspect, and from a lender's point of view and a leveraged transaction. Well, today... Uh, our guests, Hillary and Mark, who are, as I said, with ESOP Corporate Resources here in Newport Beach, California. We're going to talk about and drill down on some specific areas of ESOPs, like what should a potential ESOP candidate consider and need to have addressed to determine if their company even qualifies as an ESOP candidate, and if we have time, how flexible are ESOPs, and how can they be used as a financial tool for a company that may adopt an ESOP, and I hope you will consider this as an exit strategy, you business owners that are listening to us. This show is brought to you by our advertisers, Center Club, Community Bank, Decision Toolbox, MBN Design, Executives Unlimited, s and Rubber, Strategic Market Intelligence, SunUp Group, t and Company, Tone Software, Turn up the volume and UPS protection. The goal for this show is to help you, our listening audience of CEOs running middle market firms, to improve your decision-making skills. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I am Richard Rick Franzi. CEO Peer Groups is my Twitter handle. And on your favorite podcasting software, type in these four words, Critical Mass Radio Show, and you'll get our weekly shows updated automatically to your iTunes or whatever your podcasting software. And finally, don't miss our YouTube channel, Richard Franzi. Hillary, Mark, welcome to the studio. Hi, Rick. Thanks for having us. Uh, it's my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this show. This is one in a series of roundtable conversations. This is our second show, as I said, on ESOPs. And so, um, Hillary, I'm going to maybe ask you to get started. You know, ESOPs, which is Employee Stock Ownership Plans, can be an incredible corporate financial tool. Uh, but they're not for everyone. I recognize that. I mean, generally, ESOPs are most effective uh, for companies. I wonder if you could share a little bit about... Um, what you look for as advisors to the industry for companies that are good candidates to consider ESOP as an exit strategy? We think a good candidate for an ESOP strategy is somebody who is profitable for a starter. They're tired of paying taxes to the government. And uh, they have a market value of roughly $2 million and up. And employ roughly 20 employees or more. Can, can you, um, sorry to interrupt you. Why those two metrics? What is it in your experience that says a company with you know market value of two million and twenty employees is beginning to be the right size of a company for an ESOP? Um, ESOPs are not inexpensive to do. It's not like you get a uh, fill in the blank form off the internet and fill it in and sign down at the bottom, press hard nine copies. Uh, it does take uh, some initiative and a lot of work to put an ESOP together. So for a company that is smaller than roughly $2 million in fair market value okay. and has roughly uh, less than 20 employees, uh, it may not be economical for them. Okay, so that's really the driver of it is the financial, the initial financial commitment to do the conversion to an ESOP and then maybe the ongoing annual requirements. Of the other aspect being that if they're not profitable and they're not paying taxes, probably would not want to investigate uh, a vehicle that would provide them a tax shelter. Okay. Could could they be a smaller organization, though, that maybe is a professional services firm, you know, a group of engineers or scientists or something? Are there times when there are exceptions to these rules? There are a couple of, okay. uh, of exceptions to it. Uh, one is based on licensing. As an example, uh, a doctor's office uh, could not adapt an ESOP, and the reason is that you cannot have a nurse, as an example, who is not licensed in, in the medical profession. So even if it was big... Own stock in uh, uh, medical practice. Okay. So there are some yeah, carve The same would apply with, uh, with uh, lawyers. Interestingly enough, apparently the CPA uh, lobby was out there when ESOPs uh, were being put together, uh, because you can do it for CPAs. Hmm. Good. I hope CPAs do. Matter of fact, I think I might know of some firms that, that are CPAs. And um, so, so let's refresh our memories. And I'm going to turn my attention to Mark Nelson. And uh, if you could maybe describe exactly what an ESOP is for those that, audience that are listening, but need a little refresher. 
Employee stock ownership plans are ERISA-based plans, so they're no different to your 401k, profit sharing, money purchase, or even uh, the old uh, defined benefit plans. However, there are a couple of things that uh, distinguish ESOPs. Uh, one is their goal in life is to acquire the stock of the uh, sponsoring entity, and um, on top of that, they're allowed to actually go out and borrow money in order to acquire that stock. So from a, a standpoint of uh, flexibility, as we go on to this, this discussion, you'll see where this loan capability, which was covered in your earlier show, mm-hmm. actually comes in and uh, really builds a company's assets. The other thing about the ESOP is selling shareholders, if they meet a few very simple criteria under Code Section 1042, get to defer the capital gains tax on the sale of the stock when they use an ESOP which is incredibly important because you've got capital gains taxes going up and then you've also got the AMTs. Mm-hmm. So when you say to a business owner, oh, by the way, how would you like to sell your business? And you don't want to have to pay any capital gains tax this way. It's pretty competitive. Federal. Federal and state. And state. And they, it, for those that are listening here in California, that's a pretty heavy... That's a chunk. That, those two taxes alone are pr- would take a pretty significant amount of the proceeds of the sale away from you. Correct. And if you go back a few years when cap gains were pegged at 15%, uh, companies that were in states that did not have um, a state capital gains tax, uh, they really most often did not do the Section 1042 because they figured they'll just pay the 15% federal tax bite and be done with it. And not be restricted in the the investment options that they have. Exactly. Because the idea there is, if I understand this correctly, and tell me I'm talking with Mark Nelson right now, that what you have to do is you're sort of exchanging like stock for like stock. You're selling a U.S.-based company and you sort of need to continue to be invested in... Well, Some type of don- U.S. denominated assets, Yes, right? under 1042... Without getting too technical on no, our audience. Here. No, not at all. Under 1042, um, in, in general, you have to buy stock or bonds of domestic corporations, no government entities. Okay. Uh, the problem is, is under 1042, if you go back to the meltdown we had a few years ago, and let's just say you... I don't want to go back to that meltdown, no, I, Mark. No, I don't want either. Okay. It was, it was I, just want to, I just want to be clear about that. <laughs> no, it was ugly. Uh, the issue was, is people would sell that stock in order to uh, preserve their uh, principal. Yeah, right. Well, if you sell the stock under 1042, you generate the capital gains tax all the way back to the basis. Okay. So there's another technique we can do, and we'll explain a little further, where you can avoid that. Okay. But there are strategies to avoid or defer Absolutely. the taxes, and they are sanctioned by the federal and state governments. They Absolutely. W- this all good is on the up and it's up. It's called qualified replacement property. Thank you. Uh, we have about a minute and a half left. I wonder, uh, Hillary, if you might give us an example of, of an ESOP transaction. Let's assume you have a corporation that's worth, pick a number. $10 million. And the owner decides that he wants to sell some of his stock, pay no capital gains tax. So let's assume he decides to sell a third of his company, 33% of his stock worth $3.3 million. Without an ESOP, if he has an assumed very low basis, which is the case most of the time, because the business was started with a dollar and a half in the garage right. back in aught six or right. whatever. Right. Um, in that situation, he's going to end up paying, in California at least, uh, about a million one hundred fifteen thousand dollars of the three of, million of the three million Ouch. in taxes. Ouch! Write a check to Uncle Sam. However, with an ESOP, if it's properly designed, he can put the entire three point three million dollars into his pocket, pay no capital gains tax, and save a million one hundred fifty-five thousand in taxes. Wow. Okay, let's, we're going to set on that. I'm going to let you and the listening audience think about that for a second. Hopefully, if you're listening to us live on octalkradio.net, you'll be with us in just two short minutes when we come back from our short commercial break. If you're listening to us as a podcast off of iTunes or one of the other various podcasting services we use, don't go anywhere. The valuable information you're going to hear in the next two minutes is well worth your time. And then we're going to be back to continue the conversation with these two knowledgeable gentlemen about ESOPs after these words from our sponsors. Richard Franzi is the author of two popular business books for CEOs. His first book, Critical Mass, The Ten Explosive Powers of CEO Peer Groups, was the first book ever written on the secret value of CEO peer groups. His second book, now with newly updated information, is Critical Mass, The Power of CEO Guiding Principles. Richard's books contain powerful information to help CEOs running middle market companies gain valuable insight to improve their decision making skills. Richard's books are available as paperbacks or Kindle versions from Amazon.com. To find them, type Richard Franzi in the search box. Are you looking for your successor? 
someone as dedicated and experienced in their field as you? Executives Unlimited delivers the top executive talent you need for your company's long-term success. 98% of our clients re-engage us for additional hires and over 90% of the executives placed by us since 2007 are still in their positions or have been promoted. That's twice the industry's average retention rate. How do we do this? Dedication. Executives Unlimited believe success isn't success until it's long-term. Call us to invest in your long-term success. 562-627-3800 or visit us at executivesunlimited.com. Let our long-term success leverage yours. s h Rubber is a manufacturing company in Fullerton, California. We specialize in custom molded, extruded, and stamped rubber parts. If your next job requires a rubber part, we would appreciate the opportunity to quote on it. We serve aerospace, automotive, and many other industries. We work with many types of rubber, including silicone, EPDM, neoprene, uninitrile, and viton. Our quality system is ISO and AS9100 approved. Over our 47 years in business, the s &H brand has become known for superior quality, quick turnaround, and competitive pricing. Please check out our website at www.shrubber.com or call 714-525-0277. Let s &H be your ceiling solution. And welcome back to this edition of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am, in fact, your host, Rick Franzi. Hillary Schneider, CEO, and Mark Nelson, president of ESOP Corporate Resources, are here talking all things ESOPs in our roundtable series. This is our second show. So if you're listening to this as a podcast, you can type in the keyword ESOP, and you'll find our original show where we interviewed Martin Stabas and Keith Mulchin, where we did additional discussion about ESOPs. If you'd um, like to find any of our shows, and you can find them anytime on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, Literally several hundred former guest websites whose company's CEO has been a guest on our show, and they put that interview on their website, as well as various other podcasting services. We get literally several thousand downloads each month of the various podcasts that we do. So I'd like to return to the conversation. And, Mark, I'm going to start with you in this segment. Um, what items are initially needed to be considered by a potential ESOP company? There's a lot of items, Rick. Um, first off, there are a couple of very simple questions you can ask is, and one is, what is your tax base? You know, what is the company paying in income taxes to the feds and the state? Uh, a lot of Why is that important? Well, because everything that you do in an ESOP can reduce that tax. Okay. Rate. And the second thing is, how much payroll does the company have? Because payroll is a critical component of ESOPs. Generally speaking, 25%, just remember we talked about qualified plans earlier? Right. 25% of your eligible payroll can be used as a contribution to the ESOP and is fully deductible. So having a large payroll is a good thing okay. because the number is going to be bigger. Uh, it would be a bad situation if you had a company with $10 million with uh, $500,000 worth of payroll. You don't get to do much of a contribution. Got it. Okay, so most companies run 30 to 40% payroll you know, of, right. the, of their gross revenue. Yeah, especially so services really company. Can, right, yeah, right, exactly. Right. So that's the market. And... Um, you know, that payroll governs contribution to the ESOP. Interesting. Um, we're, in the first segment, we talked a lot tax advantage, and we talked tax advantage from the seller's perspective, mm -hmm. especially in the initial uh, sale, and maybe it's a partial sale. But it's also my understanding that all follow-on sales, let's say the own, I'm the owner and I sell it 30%, three years later I sell another 30%, and, and then I sell five years later the balance. You know, I'm just making up numbers, but ultimately it goes to 100%. Each of those successive tranches are handled the same way, correct? Tax, they're tax deferred? That's exactly right. Okay. Uh, once the 30% uh, threshold has been reached uh, by the seller of the stock to the ESOP, and it is qualified for Section 1042, that seller can sell as much as he wants in succeeding years, one share, 10 shares, 1,000 shares, and still qualify for that same tax deferral. So in effect, the selling shareholder can develop a lifetime stream of income right. funded by uh, cash flow of the corporation right. and all tax-free. So, so let's then... Let's go to the corporation side of this, right. because it's my understanding that when an ESOP becomes a 100% ESOP, it also uh, is becomes an S-corporation. Not necessarily, okay. but yes. But it can become an S-corporation. Oh, and in that situation, when it's an S-corporation, for those out there who are thinking, about well, what is my legal structure? S-corporation, the profits flow to the individuals, right? The owners? 
It's a pass-through entity. Right. Which means that the uh, taxes not be, are not paid by the corporation. The taxes are due are passed through. The income uh, earned is passed through to the individual shareholders of the S corporation, and taxes are paid at that level. And the individual owners have the ownership in an ESOP. Correct. So let's just say in your example, the ESOP is uh, the corporation is 100% owned by the ESOP. Yes. Form K1 goes to the ESOP, which is a non-taxable entity. The corporation doesn't pay any tax. Say that again. Form K1 goes to the ESOP. Yes. So it's not a taxable entity. It's a qualified plan. Right. So it pays no taxes. So not only does the sell the owner, founder of the company, as she moves through the ownership, passing it to the to their employees, doesn't pay taxes on the on the on the trans on the transaction. Once the company is 100% ESOP and they become an S corp, they don't pay taxes either. Correct. Let's clarify that. Yes. The, um, Make sure we're speaking selling correct. shareholder yes. who is selling stock to the ESOP and wants to defer. Uh, the capital gains tax on that stock sale, yes. the corporation for that one transaction only okay. needs to be a C corporation. Right. right. Thereafter, they, they convert. can convert to an S right. corporation and proceed right. as you suggested. So, so there, that's why there is an entire industry of experts like you both who help companies understand, because many business owners, this all it may, some business owners may have checked out already going, oh, there's a lot of financial gymnastics and blah, blah, blah. But actually, in fact, it's... It's a standard tr set of transactions that happened multiple times for different tr ESOPs, and you guys have seen them hun literally hundreds of times over your years in this industry? I don't think there's a scenario we haven't seen. <laughs> <laughs> and it works. Yes. yes. Okay. And no, no one is a cookie cutter. Everyone is different. Right. Every single ESOP we've worked on is totally different, and that's because every business owner is totally different. You know, it's interesting because I, um, I saw an article on A&P supermarkets filing for bankruptcy the second time they're going into bankruptcy, and one of the contributing factors is the pension liability that they had. And then I also know that one of the largest ESOPs in this country, of the 11,000 ESOPs, is Publix, which is theoretically another supermarket in mm -hmm. the southeast. And I'm wondering, um, can you, Mark, can you sort of shed from your experience and knowing kind of the background here, what's different between A&P and Publix? Well, Publix, um, whether it's Publix or even a small office here in Orange County, one of the things you'll find when you start putting an ESOP in play, yes. all of a sudden the employees become owners. Okay. And they start watching paper clips. They start watching paper. They start watching office supplies, construction businesses. You'll find tools don't get lost. So they become more profitable. The employees share in the profit because as a company becomes more profitable, the share price that is reflected in their ESOP account increases. Right. And so, when you look at a Publix versus your other example, um, everybody is much happier to contribute. Okay, th so let's take it to another level. And, okay. and what about the fact that A&P is pointing to their pension obligation mm. as a critical reason why they're, they need to go under p bankruptcy protection? One of the things about ESOPs that's very rarely ever discussed, and, and unfortunately, um, a lot of providers don't discuss this. There is a little thing out there called the Emerging Repurchase Liability Obligation. Simply put, the stock has to be able to be bought from a retiring employee. Mm -hmm. You obviously have to have cash to do that. Right. A lot of ESOPs and a lot of ESOP companies have never addressed that liability. Okay. And that liability can break an ESOP. Right, because you have to come up with a lot of cash well, that you, yeah, you have a plan you for. Exactly. You actually have to go to a bank and borrow the money, which yeah, affects which the share price. That. You don't want to do that. No. So part of the prog process in quarterbacking a transaction like this and being with providers that know what they're doing is you set up that obligation study right in the beginning and you fund it day one. Okay. Just like anything else. Okay. So you're, you're planning for the future right from the get-go? From day one. All right. You're listening to Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi. Hillary Schneider and Mark Nelson are my guests. Hillary is the CEO, and Mark is the president of ESOP Corporate Resources. Before I go on, you know, I, did, I, I just realized I didn't ask you to explain what it is your firm does. And, and maybe here we are. You know, we could get to it later. But just at a high level, Hillary, what is it that your firm does in the industry? The first thing we do is uh, analyze a, if a given company is uh, a qualified candidate for an ESOP. Um, not all companies are. Uh, we work by referral only, and out of 10 referrals that we get, uh, we pretty much discard about seven of them because okay. for one reason or another, they don't qualify uh, as an ESOP uh, potential company. Uh, 
the other three will analyze, as Mark described earlier, look at their uh, tax returns and so forth, and will de discover whether or not uh, they are a serious candidate, and we'll probably put together a, uh, an ESOP for one or two of those remaining three. What we do is bring all the required components for a successful ESOP together. The uh, RISA attorney, attorney that we use, actually wrote the code for both the uh, feds and the state of California. Uh, we'll bring together the uh, third-party administrator to do all the book work and prepare the 5500s. We'll bring together the uh, valuation expert who uh, knows how to spell ESOP, if you will. Right. Uh, if we need to get into uh, a leveraged ESOP where the bank needs to loan money, we generally have to go out and educate the bank. In Keith Mulchin's situation, no education required. Because Community Bank has made a commitment to ESOP Absolutely and funding Absolutely correct. Right. right. Um, okay. But the list goes on of all okay. these components that have to come into play and be coordinated in order to end up with a successful ESOP. That's our job. Okay. And one, one other aspect of it is we have to design the transaction. What does that mean? Well, as I said, every business owner is different. Okay. Every business is different. So just because you have a code section that says ESOP doesn't mean that you can just walk out there and cookie cut it. Yeah. You've got to design the transaction and bring all of those pieces into into the puzzle and then put the puzzle together. Right. And because, like, um, I work with a lot of small businesses and I haven't found any two that are alike, mm -hmm. right? And right. so these 10, 50, 100 million dollar companies, they all have a unique set of circumstances. That's Correct. what you're saying about structuring Correct. the deal, right? Correct. Understanding how do we get from where you are. And, and, and what I have found from an outsider looking in is while there may be a variety of things that you have to comply with, the law wants you to comply with it. It's not onerous. It is, we, we want to help you to actually do this. The, we were talking in the, in the green room before the show started. For me, this is about the most agreeable, bipartisan thing I have seen in Washington in recent times, where both Republicans and Democrats seem to see ESOPs as a good thing for our country. Correct. So it's not like people don't want you to do this. It's just they have a set of rules and regulations that you have to follow. That's why someone like you and your right. firm at quarterback it is so critical. And, and so you know the, the the rules and regulations are there for a reason, because valuations, for example, you know you can get people that are going to uh, juice the valuations. Right. Um, that's bad for the employees. Right. Uh, that's know, selling it for more than it's worth. Absolutely. Okay. And you, you you have no idea how many times we see that. And, and one of the things you you have to as an ESOP provider like us. You have to also have some experience in shutting down ESOPs that should never have been done in the first okay, place. Okay, okay. Successfully so unwinding them. Yeah, absolutely okay. unwinding them. And that is probably one of the most difficult things to I do. I would think. Yeah, it's, it, that's a whole other... May it's the subject of another show, ladies that's and right. gentlemen. <laughs> Not that we want you to unwind your ESOP once you agree <laughs> to do it. Okay, we're going to need to take our next commercial break. Hillary, did you, did you have something? To, in, okay, so uh, as I said, I'm talking with Hillary Snyder. He is CEO of ESOP Corporate Resources and Mark Nelson, who's president of ESOP, ESOP Corporate Resources. I dedicated the entire show to the subject and these two gentlemen, because as you can see, I'm just scratching the surface of their knowledge in this industry. And they're cr critical uh, organization like theirs to work with when you want to move through the ESOP process because um, while it may all sound foreign to you, these guys have been in the industry for quite some time and they know the, the right people to partner for your specific deal. So we're going to take our next and second commercial break. If you're listening to us live on octalkradio.net, don't go anywhere because we're going to come back with more of a conversation around ESOP. If you're listening to us as a podcast, stay tuned. I think you're going to be interested in hearing what our, our supporters have to say and we'll be right back after these words from our commercial sponsors. <laughs> When it comes to pioneers in their respective industries, we all know the Apples, Starbucks, and Trader Joe's of the world. In the realm of recruiting, Decision Toolbox is the industry's best-kept secret. With 90% of their business from referrals and repeat customers, for over 20 years, Decision Toolbox's U.S.-based team of recruiters, sourcers, professional writers, quality personnel, and tech support has perfected a Six Sigma approach to talent management. No matter the size of the project, Decision Toolbox delivers incredible results. A cost per hire less than half of what contingency firms charge. With the winning candidate presented in an average of 14 days. All with a 12-month candidate warranty. With results like that, Decision Toolbox won't be a secret for long. Visit us at www.dtoolbox.com for more information. 
If you are an Orange County business executive, this message is for you. Do you ever feel isolated with no place to turn for advice or feedback? Who holds you accountable to your commitments in your company? Where do you find the right resources to help you and your company grow? If you have these questions, then Critical Mass for Business might be the answer for you. Critical Mass for Business is committed to helping you make better decisions. These are groups of peers running businesses just like you, providing a great sounding board to test ideas and concepts, review plan and goals, and present issues and opportunities for discussion. The result is improved strategy, accountability, people, and execution skills. If you are interested in learning more, go to www.criticalmassforbusiness.com and learn more about our executive peer group. Successfully navigating the changing world of public relations and digital marketing requires an experienced, tenacious, yet gracious team. In business for more than 20 years, Orange County-based T&N Company delivers big agency results with personalized service. For more information, call us at 714-536-8407 or visit us online at tnco.me. And welcome back to Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi, and we're interviewing and talking to, actually just a conversation, frankly, with Hillary Snyder, who is CEO, and Mark Nelson, who is president of ESOP Corporate Advisor, sorry, ESOP Corporate Resources. They are advisors to you. Kind of think of them as the quarterback for the ESOP transaction. But you guys, uh, so there's the initial energy around the setup, which may take a, a year or six months, whatever it takes to get from where you are to having the successful launch of the ESOP, the conversion. Uh, do you guys stay with your clients past that first tranche, that first transaction? How does your relationship with your client work? Part of the joke with our clients is that once they retain us to do the ESOP, they're stuck with us for life. Okay. Well, <laughs> so, I think that's a good thing, though. Oh, it is. Absolutely. Right? It's, it's a, a marriage. Thing. Right. Because, as you said, they may, they may have a... A schedule from which to sell additional mm -hmm. value. There's vesting. There's a lot of stuff that uh, now, once it's in theory, then you have to put it into practice. I'm sure. sure you guys are very valuable to them, calling with questions. Maybe you work with their in-house fiduciary or whatever your role might be. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. uh, um, Mark. When can a com When is a company? We talked a little bit with Hillary earlier about the kind of qualifications, but again, when is a company large enough for an ESOP? Company. <sighs> To be large enough for an ESOP is, is sort of a, a loaded question because you'll hear um, some of the big accounting houses say, oh, well, you're not big enough for an ESOP. Well, if you're not a $100 million company and you're not making $10 million worth of profit, you're not big enough. Well, if you're a $10 million company you're making a $1 million worth of profit or taxable income, what's the difference? Right. I agree. I mean, it's still, you know, a, a million dollars to a small company right. is right. the same as $10 million to a $100 million company. Right. So there really is no big enough small enough scenario it really comes down to you know are they profitable do they have a management team do they have um, the ability to put money into ESOP to utilize the plan mm -hmm. as it's intended you don't have to contribute to an ESOP every year unless you have some debt that you have to service it is pretty much like a profit sharing plan it's a discretionary contribution okay unless you have to service a loan of some right. kind which Typically, you don't, you'll never find a bank, certainly a community bank would never go out and loan more than about 40% of the value of the company okay. in any one tranche to an ESOP. Right. Just they won't do it because, you know, what happens when you cannot pay? You know, one of the things, uh, and, I, and I, Hillary, I'm going to come to you next, and I, I want to know about alternatives, you know, why wouldn't a company use an ESOP? So mm -hmm. set on that question, but Mark, before I leave you, one of the things that I understand as another tax advantage of an ESOP is, let's say it's a leveraged ESOP, I mm -hmm. took out a loan to fund the first tranche, and uh, I'm repaying principal and interest. Uh, clearly, the interest has tax deduction, but I, it's my understanding that the principal does as well? Principal as well, yes, and depending whether you're a C-Corp or an S-Corp, you get to deduct you know, different amounts, but... Um, it's amazing when we do some of these structures, we'll put a building into a corporation and we'll use an ESOP structure and uh, pay off the building in four to seven years, principal being deductible in this transaction because it's a contribution to a qualified plan. Uh, think about that, ladies and gentlemen. This is, this is, in my opinion, this is the authors of the plan 
thinking through pretty well how do we make this work for companies because there is a certain amount of effort that goes into it Correct. but we let how many inducements can positive inducements can we put into this legislation and regulations to try to give them beneficial reasons to do this and give the employees an opportunity to build a successful company that's really what they're doing yes. they're helping the employees to fund the loan that they took against the buying out the owner all right very true yeah i think it's uh, ladies and gentlemen i think this is a uh, I love ESOPs in concept because I think it addresses one of our long-term challenges in this country, which is consolidation of wealth. I think this provides an opportunity for employees to not just think like an owner but actually and act like an owner, but actually to be an owner, Correct. which is only good things if you do it right. But uh, we're going to talk about that in another show. What's it take to get an ownership culture started in your mm -hmm. company? Right now, wh why wouldn't somebody uh, go with an ESOP? What's the alternatives? A lot of, <clears throat> of what we do is education. Okay. Um, we have to educate the potential candidate for an ESOP about what an ESOP is, how it works, why it works, and what the alternatives are. And there are a number of alternatives, uh, such as a management buyout. Uh, Managers man never have money, though. Yeah, that's the problem. I've, I've been doing this a long time. I don't think I've ever met a company where the management group had two nickels to rub together where they could potentially buy out the uh, selling shareholder. Uh, you could also do a um, you know, Section 162 bonus program that provides the, the money in order to finance uh, the transaction. There's a whole host of uh, different approaches that you can utilize. The problem is the ESOP is the only scenario in which the selling shareholder does not have to pay any capital gains tax. It's deferred. It is deferred and it can be permanently deferred. Okay. As an example, let's say our shareholder sells some stock to the ESOP under 1042, does all the sequential items that need to be done in order to defer uh, that capital gains tax. If he holds on to his qualified replacement property, and we'll get to that in a little bit, um, until he eventually dies, everything gets a stepped up basis and there's never any capital gains tax paid hmm. by either him or his family or his heirs. Really? But it just keeps getting better and better here, doesn't it? <laughs> Other than the fact that the person died. Up to that point, things were great. But for his heirs, right. life is still good. Yeah, well, they may miss the founder. All right. Uh, we're, I'm just having a little bit of fun with our guests today, who are <laughs> Hillary Snyder and Mark Nelson. They're both with ESOP Corporate Resources. Um, Mark, when is the client's company in the correct type of industry for an ESOP? Are there industries that are uh, better for ESOP companies? Um, not really. They're pretty much uh, industry neutral. We touched on earlier about um, uh, licensing issues for lawyers, doctors, things like that. One that's very often overlooked is construction companies. Any sort of entity that is going to be required to provide bonding, for uh -huh. example, last thing you ever want to do is get into an ESOP that has some kind of a loan regime because it's a direct and effective bonding account directly. Okay. So. Um, you want to stay away from that in construction businesses, but pretty much anything else, okay. it's all... Manufacturing. Manufacturing, it's all out there. Um, you want to try to avoid putting ESOPs into companies that have 100% turnover every year, obviously. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, because yeah. this yeah. is a long-term retention it's a strategy, long -term right? long-term retention strategy, right. right. And um, I was at uh, one of my clients who had um, their first uh, annual stock and they handed out ownership to the employees and on average they gave every employee roughly 20 percent of their annual earnings in stock value 20 percent and and i'm thinking uh... And, and i was honored to be able to be in the meeting where i saw it and and he uh, the organization has a great cross-section of orange county employees some of which i'm thinking this may be the first largest contribution to mm -hmm. their retirement in their in their thirties you know for but sure. for the future what a what an amazing day that is to be able to, and how good the owner felt being able to give this out to people. Right. Yeah, and, and if you look at the top 100 ESOPs, essentially 13 are supermarket chains, 10 manufacturing, 8 are in engineering, 7 in construction, 3 in drug stores, so, and the rest are pretty much spread across all other industries, and that's the 100 largest. Okay. So it's pretty and, diverse. And there are 11,000 plus that are in this Roughly, country. Roughly, yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 
I also saw, uh, uh, I see a concentration of professional organizations, um, um, uh, researchers, engineers, people like that who f maybe have a, have a corporate culture and, you know, a more educated workforce, let's say, because they all have degrees. But I've also seen it work where you don't have this highly educated workforce, right? right. So, so that's not necessarily a condition of a successful ESOP, is it? We have a client who um, is in manufacturing. Most of the... Uh, um, participants in ESOP don't speak English, but I cannot tell you how many of them have four or five hundred thousand dollar account values. Can you imagine that? Yeah. I mean, isn't that? Yeah. I mean, that, that just sounds good, right? Yeah. I mean, anyway, uh, uh, we're we're keeping this down the middle, ladies and gentlemen, talking about ESOPs. So you know, earlier we kind of talked about S corp, C corp, so and and sometimes maybe some of them in, in our audience get a little bit. So I want to kind of come back to that if if I could. And um, does the company need to be a regular C corp? or a sub chat Let, let's kind of can Drill i guess i'm looking at you again mark right. but can you sort of just kind of llc can you just kind of de de jargonize that for us a little the bit only transaction in an esop well esop transaction that you have to be a c corp in is when you sell stock and you want to exercise 1042 that's it okay so you can be a an s corp convert to a c do the stock sale. Obviously, you've got to get your lawyers, your tax advisors in, analyze that situation. Um, and there are also, you, as you mentioned earlier in the show, there were companies that were S's, went to C's, and a number of years later went back to an S. So if you plan these structures very well, you can actually engineer your tax returns right. so you don't have all those transfer for value rules, all these other things that come into play. LLCs need to obviously become an S or a C. But, you know, to, to the only transaction is a C-Corp for a 1042. That's it. Okay. And so if I'm, if I'm the seller and I want to do it over a three-year period, I probably, and I'm an S-Corp, I'd probably convert to a C and stay at C until 100% ownership goes to the employees. Correct. Then they would convert it back to Correct. an S, and I would get all the tax advantage benefits of that, and they would too. Correct. And, okay. and, and on that sale, it's basically... Sounds the, simple. Yeah, it's a perfect installment sale. <laughs> right. Think about it. I've never seen an installment sale that ever worked. Yeah, and you have a very friendly buyer. Exactly. Right? Very patient, friendly buyer. You know, I'm going to be doing a radio show with an attorney who does mergers and acquisitions, mm -hmm. and and I asked him. I said, "Would you be comfortable if we talked about the litigation that sometimes happens in that?" And he said, "Whenever he hears the term earnout, he thinks lawsuit. Absolutely. So that's one of the things you avoid, right? right in this kind of a uh, situation. Right. So um, we only have a few minutes, uh, like a minute left. I tell you what, I think I'm going to call it uh, time. We're going to end, end this segment a little bit early, give us a little bit more time on the other end. Because, Hillary, I wanted to ask you about uh, what if a company is an S-corporation, anything special that they need to look at? So if you're an S-corporation now, and many of you listening are, uh, don't go anywhere, because after the commercial break, uh, Hillary Snyder is going to give us a little more content on this. All right, you're listening to Critical Mass Radio Show on octalkradio.net. We'll be right back after these words. Wow. Marketing predictions are out for 2015, and marketing success is changing. Did you know that Google is now actively tracking your business and personal brand and online reputation? Online and offline marketing has changed. Google is driving more than 85% of your traffic. And if your brand is inconsistent or has poor mobile usability, your rankings and traffic can suffer in 2015. To learn how your business is currently viewed, and what can be done to improve your brand's visibility and authority? Contact SunUp Group for a free marketing analysis. It could be a business game changer. Visit www.sunupgroup.com today or call 877-609-3840, extension 700. Are you ready to tap into the power of social media to promote your business? It's easy to get social with Turn Up the Volume, the award-winning social media marketing professionals who know how to get results. Drive web traffic, boost sales, get social today. Visit www.turnupthevolume.com. That's turnupthevolume.com. Richard Franzi is a highly sought-after keynote speaker on topics of interest to CEOs of middle firms across North America. Richard's talks include Killing Cats Leads to Rats, a fascinating look at how unintended consequences of CEOs' decisions impact their firm's performance. 
Your Gray Matter Matters, which explores how a CEO's mindset can differentiate a middle market firm and define its culture. Richard delivers talks to a variety of audiences, ranging from executive team retreats to keynotes in front of hundreds of CEOs. To learn more about his talks, visit criticalmassforbusiness.com and select the contact page or call 949-887-4104. Welcome back to Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franz, Hillary Schneider, who is CEO, and Mark Nelson, who is the president of ESOP Corporate Resources, are my guests. This is one of our special roundtable editions of Critical Mass Radio Show, heard live on octalkradio.net, and we're talking about ESOPs, Employee Stock Ownership Plans. Um, Hillary and Mark, I'm going to ask you what are the rough spots or maybe why? what are the downfalls or risks of an ESOP? But before I get there, I said it before the break, Mark or, or Hillary, I wanted to ask you, if a company is already an S corporation, is there anything special for them to look at as they consider converting to an ESOP? The first thing to look at is um, on their tax return to look at the M2 account or AAA account which is money that's in the corporation on which taxes have already been paid and could be distributed uh, to the owner. The problem is that in most corporations that have an M2 account, that cash has been already spent on something else. Okay. But it's still owed to the shareholders of the S corporation. So that being the case, uh, we need to convert the um, AAA account um, before we change from a S corporation to a C corporation. Okay. The reason being that when we change to the C corporation, the AAA account is recharacterized as retained earnings. Okay. Very difficult to get that out of a corporation. Right. Uh, Hence the name. To solve the <laughs> to solve that uh, issue, normally the uh, selling shareholder would take back a note uh, for the value of the AAA account. The downside of that is that creates debt, which lowers the value of the corporation. Right, and while these, while the, there's a lot of inter, interrelated things to consider in the ESOP to maximize er, the, the opportunity for ev- all parties involved, because I really think this is a win-win-win for the, for everyone versus maybe a merger and acquisition, which may turn out to be a win-lose. It, but you don't see it at the time, but three years later you might look back on it and go, "Ooh, that wasn't that didn't turn out as I expected it to." Um, I, I think. They are easier to understand if you're willing to spend the energy with someone like you or new fir- your firm to kind of just talk through it. Because these are successful business people who've dealt sure. with pretty detailed level challenges in their business, financial, and they, they can understand this. There's nothing here that can't be understood by a successful entrepreneur if they just spend the time, right? Correct. All right. Well, uh, we also have to simplify it a little bit. You've right. got to be able to have a conversation with them versus throwing tax code. And in fact, the only piece of tax code you'll see us throw around is 1042. 1042. That's and that's a good really piece. Counts. That's yeah. a good piece. It's the only one that really counts. That's your deferred tax. Tax exactly. You want to know that one. Yeah, you yeah, want to right. know that that's one. A good, that's like people learning their 401k. You need to understand what a 401k right. and an IRA are. Okay. Um, before we get to the pitfalls, um, what about control of the company? You know, the, the fact that you become an ESOP, an employee, where the employees own the company, does that mean they also then control the company? I mean, the pitchforks come out. What, what, what happens there? I have never met a company owner who voluntarily wanted to give up control. Right. Um, the employee participants in the ESOP uh, have a value on the certificates that they send or receive each year that tells them what their ESOP account value is, but they have no vote, they have no control. It is the outside shareholders who appoint themselves as ESOP committee trustee, and it's the trustee that votes the shares in the ESOP. Right. So as an example, if we had a um, three shareholders, one who owned 66%, another who owned 20%, and a third who owned 14% of the corporation, our 66% shareholder could sell 30% of his stock in order to qualify for that uh, tax deferral right. uh, approach. So it has to be 30%. That's, That's the, the minimum. The minimum. That's the minimum. F- okay. The, f- the threshold uh, okay. for that. Um, he could sell uh, 30% of his stock to the ESOP, pay no capital gains tax, and still maintain control because his remaining 36% of the stock he still has in his pocket Mm -hmm. is greater than the 14% and the 20% of the other two shareholders combined. Right. So therefore, he uh, votes his 36% that's in his pocket, and as self-appointed ESOP committee trustee, he votes the 30% that was sold to the ESOP. Right. So it is an ownership structure, not a control structure, right? 
I mean, yeah. the management still is the management. You're a well-run company. You'll be a yeah. well-run company with the nothing changes. Nothing changes in that area. Correct. Okay, this is really about the ownership of the company. And, and there are there are instances when you start doing significant transactions. Our recommendation is going to be we get an outside fiduciary, an outside trustee into right. arm's length the transaction, right. solely because you don't ever see. Uh, and this would be one of the bad sides of an ESOP: self dealing. Self dealing is always bad. Okay. Um, Can you define that term? We go, and, we go out and buy a company airplane with the tax savings. It's a bad thing to do unless everybody's a pilot. Okay. So you, you do not want to... You, remember, this is a qualified plan. It's operated under ERISA. You have to operate it in a prudent manner. Right. Even though the company management may not change, um, you cannot avoid looking after the employee's best interests. That is the primary that's responsibility the of the fiduciary. Exactly. Is to that's look the after the employees. Point, right? and, that, and that's what the Department of Labor wants to see. Exactly. And so, you know, you, it does, you don't have to change the way your company runs. Um, you just have to run it responsibly. And if you, if you took, a look, took a look at the last six years when we had however many thousand construction companies, some percentage of them had ESOPs. Well, those companies either terminated their ESOPs or went out of business entirely. None of those folks ever got nailed as a, as a bad fiduciary, that was a business cycle. Right. But if you, let's assume that we hadn't had that, and we had a company that was worth $100 million, had $20 million worth of profits, and all of a sudden, we've got people driving around in Bentleys and basically taking every, every dime they can get out of the company, especially in an S corporation, um, you're going to start seeing abuses, and there, the IRS did come up with some guidelines for anti-abuse on S corporations that have adopted ESOPs. Okay. And those violating those those provisions carry some real teeth. I mean, they have put people in to the federal pen because it goes down as tax evasion. Right. Well, it just it just sounds abusive. It the is. Way you, when you describe it that way, it just right. sounds like it's not right. Whether it's illegal or not, it just yeah. doesn't sound like you're building an, an ownership culture with your employees if, if all of a, a sudden... If it's a duck, it quacks. Yeah, right. right. So good business practices are good, good business, business practices, practices, practices of your right. structure. Are, are there any other pitfalls that an owner should be aware of? Yeah, expense. ESOPs are complicated, so you have expenses. If you have stock in the ESOP, you have to have an annual valuation. You've got the administration of the ESOP every year, just like you would your 401k or profit sharing. You're going to have transactional expenses, be it your lawyers... ERISA lawyers and any um, additional accounting because most accountants don't understand ESOPs very well and they have to be brought up to speed and this is all billable time. So w r when we asked in the beginning, you know, what's the right size company, it's, it comes down to economics. You've got to look at what are the profits, is the scale there, uh -huh. do they have the payroll, and that's the first determining factor. Right. Because if they don't have any of those things, why incur the expense? Right. There's really not the value there. Right. And okay. there's one last thing. Yes. There's, there's some charlatans out there, unfortunately, and they do do things they shouldn't be doing. And as we had mentioned earlier, there's, there's a lot of broken ESOPs you know, that should never have been done. I think the other uh, two items that we run across frequently are um, competitors, if you will, of ours uh, that will go into a client. They'll say, here's what we can do, and they lowball their fee. And then as the process uh, un ravels if you will they run up the bill oh you got to have this oh you got to have change that. notes yeah, yeah. oh yeah and then, oh. all of a sudden you're back up to um, huge substantial fees the other one uh, problem that we run into and keith mulchin and community bank do not do this by the way um is the lending industry's favorite phrase which is you need to give us all of your accounts to enhance mm -hmm. our business relationship and uh, what they're trying to do is get a hold of the uh, cash that's in the ESOP or in the repurchase liability obligation funding account and uh, put that under their wing. And inadvertently, if they gave a loan to one of the executives in the group at a fifth of a point less than market, mm -hmm. that's a violation. The entire plan can be disqualified all the way back to day one. That's that's interesting because that's that's one of the things that I think I've learned about this is that um, you need to have the right set of outside advisors, mm -hmm. but you also need to find some number of people in your company who are willing to learn the the rules and the terms of your own ESOP, correct, and have those be alive 
because to your point earlier, Mark, not every ESOP is identical, so you've come up with different vesting structures. There, there needs to be a group of people in the company, and you can't just give this to your HR department necessarily. Correct. I think the executives and the leadership, they need to own the fact that they understand what their terms of their ESOP are. Mm-hmm. And it has, it has to be a living kind of a thing. Right. Not just learn it to do the transaction. I mean, you've yeah, got to really understand right. it. There needs to be a committee of, of those folks. And um, we find the ones that work best are the ones where you have the executives all the way down to project managers mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, that type of leadership level in on meetings and they'll hear stuff. They are the ones that have to transmit this to the labor force. Right. And if they don't understand it, no one else is going to understand it. Right. Uh, we're not, we're, I'm sorry, go ahead. We're also big believers in educating the employees down to the ground level. And we, uh, once we implement an ESOP, we hold employee meetings. We explain to them in layman's terms what an ESOP is, what it means to them as individuals, and how they can uh, increase the value of the company, which in turn increases the value of their ESOP account. Right, and uh, my experience in that, and in, in not just in that subject matter, but taking on a project like that, is it, it's over time. Mm-hmm. You have to mm-hmm. you have to have a long term ph- philosophy on how you're going to educate your people about the fact that they are now becoming owners of something that is valuable and could be more valuable. Exactly correct. And and the perfect sort of person is somewhere in their fifties, fifty five, who's got a, a five ten year exit plan. Because then you can really plan this correctly. Right. It's when we walk into a situation we've got a seventy two year old and he says, mm-hmm. Oh, I wish I'd met you guys twenty years ago. Right. That's just not going to. That's probably right. one that shouldn't. So be you're done. saying, from a seller's perspective, having somebody who's got Correct. some time it's to gradually, strategy. right? Yes, it's got and, to be planned. And it, uh, from what I can tell, if done right, there's really no contention in it. It's not an adversarial buy sell no. kind of a thing. No. It's a, not at all. It's a kind of let's all work together on this. And it's it's sort of, from my perspective, a way for the owner, the founder, to leave a little bit of a legacy, not just of the, of the fact that he or she started the company, but that there's a group of people now who are more capable of running a business than they were when you hired them because right. you've, you've invested in them as a workforce. And and from what I can tell in these hops, they have a much higher retention rate. Yes. Absolutely. So there are, we haven't even got into the organizational values of an ESOP or the business performance. We talked about tax advantages a lot in today's, but the research shows that ESOP companies, by and large, outperform non-ESOP companies. Substantially. So, so that we're going to have that, ladies and gentlemen, conversation in one of the future roundtables here on Critical Mass Radio Show. If someone would like to learn more about what your firm can do for them, where do they find you guys online? What's your website? The website is www.esop, E-S-O-P, corporate, spelled out, resources.com. And the uh, information that on there is a great preliminary primer for em- anybody who'd like to learn more about ESOPs uh, in addition to what we discussed today. Hillary Snyder, CEO, Mark Nelson, President, ESOP Corporate Resources. Thank you very much for giving a fraction of what you know about this wonderful opportunity for American businesses to transfer wealth. I've really enjoyed the conversation today. Thank you for your time in the studio. Thank you, Rick. Thanks for having us, Rick. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed this show and you've listened to it in its entirety. Like I said, my shows are all keyword searchable. You can find the earlier show with the community bank, etc. Uh, if you just type in ESOP. Also, um, we're going to be doing roundtables in the future. Send this out to friends and family as well, people in your company, others who are business owners who might be considering an exit strategy. Please look at ESOPs. You know, this goal is to help you, our listening audience of CEOs who are running middle market firms to improve your decision-making skills. And this show would not be possible without great guests like I've had in the studio today and our advertisers like Center Club, Community Bank, Decision Toolbox, Executives Unlimited, MBN Design, SNH Rubber, Strategic Market Intelligence, SunUp Group, T & Company, Tone Software, Turn Up the Volume, and UPS Protection. Connect To connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm Richard Rick. Francy, CEO Peer Groups is my Twitter handle, and in your favorite podcasting software like iTunes, type in Critical Mass Radio Show. Finally, don't forget to check out our YouTube channel. We videotaped this entire show today, and this show will be available as a video on our YouTube channel, Richard Franzi, in the future. If you want to learn more about Critical Mass for Business, visit criticalmass4forbusiness.com. Until our next show, I hope all of your business decisions will move your company in a positive direction. 